All right. Well, good evening. Welcome to the Friday Night Bible Study on Discipleship. Uh, tonight, we are still working our way through the Discipleship Guide. We are on the topic of knowing God. And this topic explores God's desire to know his children intimately and what it means to actually know him. Uh, before we begin, though, let's have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us to another Friday evening, the chance to come together to study your word. Lord, we we'll ask you be with those who could not be with us tonight, uh, be with those who may be traveling, Lord. We ask you also be with those who will be watching this uh, recording later. Uh, send your spirit to be with us and be with them that they may be blessed. Yeah, we thank you for asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. So what does it mean to actually know him? So we're. I think this is going to be an interesting study. Obviously not uh, anything too too deep. We're just going to read some text where it gets laid out very plainly, I think, and uh, see what we can learn from that. We're going to start. I think, Carmen, I started with you last week. I'm going to do that again this week. You can read John 17, verses 1 through 3. John 17, 1 through 3. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority to over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one of you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the only the one you sent to earth. Thank you. Of course, this is the New Living Translation, if you're reading from the, the book. I did look up uh, in the New King James uh, just to compare the text because I was curious about the ending where it talks about the this is the way to have eternal life. And it's virtually the same thing. It's not, hardly any change at all in the way it's phrased. Mm -hmm. So the language is not that different. It is to know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ. So Jesus here is equating eternal life with knowing God. Mm -hmm. Right. So now the question I have asked here is, so how do we finite mortals, right? We have finite minds. How do we get to know an infinite God? Can we get to know an infinite God? Yes. Yes. When we ask. When we ask. Okay. Um, Jesus. Well, how do you get to know anybody? Uh -huh. If you're wanting to get to know anybody, you spend time with them. Exactly. Okay. Ask so, questions. Can, can you get to know God if you give him an hour a week? No. <laughs> no. Probably not going to work, superficially, right? Superficially. Yeah. Very superficially. Like maybe someone you acquaintance at work yeah. type thing where you yeah. may see them uh, in meetings at work or things like yeah. that. All right. So it brings us faith fact number one. Eternal life is based primarily on knowing the mind and heart of God, which makes sense because if you don't know him, you don't know his mind. It's kind of hard to obey. You don't know what he wants you to do. Right? You just don't understand. So it brings to mind at camp meeting, one of the morning manna sessions about the parables. And it was about the, the wedding feast. Mm -hmm. And the statement at the end was, depart from me. I, or, anyway, the, you, he, he didn't know that, the guest. Yeah. Oh, the, the one who uh, didn't put on the right. wedding garments. Says, on. I don't yeah. Know you. yeah. And so we don't go into heaven unless God knows us. Yeah. That's right. Not going to be any strangers in heaven. Right. None, no, none no, whatsoever. He knows us. Yes. All right. So I thought that was an interesting way to start the lesson. Mm -hmm. So, because a lot of people say, well, how do you get eternal life? It's, well, you got to do this, you got to do that. And this is, that's not it, right? It's knowing God. Now we're going to find out that knowing God leads to those other things. Yeah. But we're going to get through that as we go through the study. And somewhere scripture says that you don't know God unless he invites you. Mm -hmm. Do it, we're going to. So that all ties into eternal life. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to get through all of that too. Yeah. Right. Had the whole process of knowing God. All right. Now, of course, it's it's a process knowing God. It's not like, you know, you join the church today and wham, you know God tomorrow. Right. Uh, you begin to know God. I don't think we'll ever truly, uh, truly know him until we're 
We're in heaven. Now we can know him well enough to get through this world and this life, uh, know the things that we need to know about him, but understand that that's just scratching the surface because he's an infinite God, right? Then again, do you think really we'll ever, we're going to spend eternity up there. Will we ever know everything about God? I don't think we'll ever know everything. I don't either. But uh, it's going to be fun. You think after a thousand years, right? When we're just starting after that, that millennium, when they come, yeah. come down to New Jerusalem, settles on this earth, we would have just gotten started. And a lot of that time was getting to know God's judgments and studying those and understanding that it's fair and righteous and agreeing with what, what he decided, which will tell us something about his character. But after that, once all of that and all of this is done, then we can get to know God like Adam and Eve did in the Garden yeah, of Eden no, before no, all this. No barriers. No barriers. Yeah, that'll be that'll be interesting. But it's interesting now, I think, to know how he speaks to us. Mm -hmm. He doesn't speak to me all the time, but now and then. And when he does, it's like, wow, you know, because he'll he'll tell you to do something. If you do it, then you see the results of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes you're like, you want me to do what? Was <laughs> <laughs> that way by in that roll later at the Pathfinder yard sale? Okay. I went back to that half a dozen times. It just kept calling me back and kept hearing this voice. You need to buy it. And a day later, Wanda called. We were talking and she needed one. See? There you go. All right. So let's move on to the next text. Uh, it's Philippians 2, 1 through 5. Rodney, if you can read that for us. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. All right. And I believe this was the English standard version. Yeah. Uh, but I, this is showing us the goal, right? We want to get to where we have the same mind that Jesus had, which obviously is quite a bit different than the minds we have now. All right. So, and of course it talks in, we'll get to the text where it talks about being transformed and all that, but this is the goal. And the faith fact that goes with this text is that God desires us to transform our understanding of him by putting on the mind of his son, Jesus Christ. Right? We know that Jesus, one of the reasons he came to earth, one of his missions was to reveal the father to us so that we could get to know God more fully. Because there was a huge misunderstanding uh, at the time among God's people of what God's character was like. So Jesus reveals God to us, and by becoming like Jesus, by getting his mind, we get to understand God better. So I think that's uh, that's a goal we need to keep in mind, that that's something we're working towards. That's not something you're probably going to hit today or tomorrow, but you should be getting closer to that as you progress. Right? And of course, as a disciple of Jesus, which is what the study is all about, you know, we want to be like Jesus. Mm -hmm. right? Why would you want to be a disciple of someone if you didn't want to emulate them? <laughs> It wouldn't make any sense. Right. All right. So let's move on to the next text. This is Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. And Tyane, you can read that. Don't let the wise brag of their wisdom. Don't let heroes, heroes mm -hmm. brag of their exploits. Don't let the rich brag of their riches. If brag, brag of this and this only, that you understand and know me. I am God, and I act in loyal love. I do what's right and set things right and fair and delight in those who do the same things. These are my trademarks. Interesting. And uh, that's from uh, the message uh, version of the Bible. So again, this is emphasizing that our highest goal is of, uh, of learning is to know God, right? If we want to uh, brag on anything, right, we should be bragging on God. Right? Not that it's telling us to brag on God. Right. Or God doesn't need us to brag on him. Right. If we if we uh, get to yeah, if we get to know him, 
and we get to emulate his character, then that's going to be saying everything God needs us to say. So getting to know God, and I like that the way this text put it, that these are my trademarks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where he's talking about it. What, what are his trademarks? Is I'm God. I act in loyal love. Mm -hmm. Something this world doesn't know a whole lot about. Do what's right. I do what's right. I set things right and fair and delight in those who do the same things. So I thought that was interesting, interesting way to phrase it. All right. So the highest goal of learning is to know God. That was faith fact number three. And we'll go down to uh, Romans 11, 36 through 12, too, which is not as long as it looks. <laughs> All right, Nicole. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. All right, there's a whole lot in this text. First off, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice. It says to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Does that mean he wants us to lay ourselves out on an altar? And No, because no. No, it says living, right? So obviously that's not it. What I might want doesn't count. It's what he wants. I was thinking wants. put his will before mine. Yeah, mm -hmm. to offer ourselves to do his will. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think it gives us a big hint there. Holy and pleasing to God which means that we should be doing the things that are pleasing to God. And it says, it equates this with true and proper worship. So one way we worship is by doing God's will. Or put another way, worship doesn't stop in the sanctuary. It doesn't stop in the sanctuary. That, that's right. Worship should be a way of life, yeah. not something you do once a week. Or some people once a day, right? Because there, there are people who have their daily worship services. I don't want to uh, say that that's, you know, a bad thing. It's not, but it shouldn't end when you say amen, you get up on your knees and go about your business and say, all right, I'm done. I've, I've done my bit. And then it goes on, of course, we get talking about the transformation part. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we'll get into that. How does the mind get renewed a little bit later on? I need that. Renewal. We all need that every day, every day. All right. So faith fact number four says, one can only know the will of God by having a renewed and transformed mind. So it's, it's impossible for us to know the will of God if we're living in the, the worldly worldly state right? it's a choice it's a choice you got to make the choice yeah. uh, you have to have to do that have that renewal and then you can actually know the will of god and do the things that pleases him so uh, i think you have people who try to put the cart for the horse they try to live that holy life without having that transformation that renewing of the mind and the transformed mind and as a result of that they fail miserably because when you have that worldly state of mind, there's no way you're going to be able to do the will of God. It's just not going to work. What the Pharisees did. What the Pharisees did, yeah. What well, Jesus said, you know, and they were teaching the right things, yeah. but they were not doing the right things. And Jesus would tell people, he said, you know, do what they say, not what they do. <laughs> right? Don't be like them. So, so that's, I think, an important thing to remember. All right. So that brings us back to uh, Ephesians 3. 16 through 19, we're back to you, Carmen. Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is his love, or his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to un understand fully. 
then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. So this text tells us a little bit about the transformation process, right? He says that we would have unlimited resources, right? He will empower us uh, with inner strength through his spirit. So through the work of the spirit, Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. So having Christ in the heart uh, through the spirit, you know, Christ is not physically in your heart. So it's through the spirit. Then it says your roots will grow down into God's love. So it's like a plant, right? When he gets into the good, the good soil and the water and those roots start going down and that uh, becomes a strong, healthy plant that can endure a lot of things. So we need those roots to grow down into God's love to keep us strong. Again, that's a process, it takes time. And may you have the power to understand. So once we have that, then we become capable of actually understanding as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. So it's it's like until then, we're not even capable of understanding how much he loves us. And we, we can think, well, Jesus' sacrifice reveals his love, but even that's just a glimpse of how much he actually loves us. I, I just found that uh, uh, an interesting uh, way they way they translated that. The New King James is pretty close to and how it states that. So it gets the same message across. But I think this is this plain English is probably a little bit easier for a lot of people to understand. It says, and then once you have that, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. All right. So the question that I had there then. It says, so how do we grow to see things from God's perspective? It's not in your books. It's the one I wrote. <laughs> is everyone looking? Where is that? So That's, with that, how do we grow? How do we grow to see things from God's perspective? Well, that's just, well, we can't do it on our own. No. We oh. have to ask. You have to ask. All right. So that's something we have to be seeking. Yes. We have to study his word. Mm-hmm. As we yield to his spirit. Yes. So yield to the spirit, right? And Christ dwells within you and you set those roots down. So it takes time, right? And But as you uh, grow closer to God, as you begin to emulate uh, the nature of Christ. And as we trust him. As we trust him. That yeah. gets into every day. Yeah, yeah, you have to trust him, right? You're not going to get anywhere if you don't trust him. Uh, so that brings us to faith fact number five, right? As we continue to grow in love, remember God is love. As we begin to develop that character of love in ourselves, God's perspective of life will increasingly become our perspective of life. Right? I don't know that we'll fully have God's perspective because he sees, he knows things and sees things that we don't. There's still going to be things we don't understand, but we'll understand enough to know that God sees the bigger picture and we'll have that trust that Rodney was talking about to uh, just yield it, yield to him and, and go where he wants us to go. So God is love. That's his basic character. Mm -hmm. And as we get to know him, we can get that character development. Mm -hmm. Yep. We get that character development. Of course, if you understand that God is love, and that's a whole new perspective on things. Yeah, a whole new perspective. With that as the basis, yeah. uh, it's easier to trust him because he's not going to yeah. do anything that's not out of love. Yes. Right. So that's important. Very important. All right. Uh, so that brings us to Proverbs 2, uh, verses 1 through 5. I think we're to Rodney now. Yes. Yeah. My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord, and you will gain knowledge of God. All right. So a couple of things in here. Uh, first, this actually starts to give us process, right? But so the, the first question I'm going to ask here is how do we grow in our knowledge of God? I think we touched on it earlier. And this text brings a little bit more out. 
What are some of the first things? thing he says is listen to what I say. Who knows? Read, listen, read the Bible. Yep, read the Bible. Listen, mm -hmm. right? When God tells you something, don't disregard it. Right? Just say, well, that doesn't apply to me. <laughs> right? I'm pretty sure what God spoke applies to everybody. So read the Bible like it's ultimate truth because it is. It is. Yeah. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then uh, what else? What else? Um, this text gives us quite a few things. Mm -hmm. So not just reading it and listening to it, but actually looking for things mm -hmm. that, that could be there, like okay. digging for a treasure. Yeah. yeah. Just cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Ask for understanding, yeah. Like it says, tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. So this isn't just a casual reading. Right. Right. Say, well, you know, I'm going to read this this book in a year and just sit down and I'm going to knock out 40 pages today and just whip through it. Right. This is uh, someone who's actually focused on what they're reading and they may they may get through 10 or 15 pages a day. They may get through one. You know, if they get something that really just gets a hold of. Them. You do it with the program that I'm using and you're going to, you go real slow. It's called soul. So scripture, observation, uh, application, and prayer. And you read your passage. Uh, you're reading, I'm reading through, so I don't know, sequentially. But you read only until you get a truth, a verse that speaks. And then you stop and, and do all the, write down all the things. All the things, yeah. That, so, can, that can take some time. So it can take... It can take five days to get through a paragraph sometimes because it can, like these, it, it can be loaded. Mm -hmm. Yep. I remember when we did uh, Revelation verse, verse by verse. Yeah. <laughs> we, I mean, every single word has meaning. And that took us a year, long, long a year and a half, I think, long to get to through. Say it's about a year and a half. It took us to get all the way through Revelation. Yeah, just doing it and there's in that detail. So, <laughs> Yeah, which gets me through today. Today was very disappointing. I don't know what I did or if the computer did it, but all my notes oh, no. are computerized. Mm -hmm. All my notes are gone. I, I went to save what I did today and it, it erased everything. I don't know what went on, but oh. mm. I about cried for a minute and I said, well, no, God will give me things again. Yeah. We'll yeah. go through it again. It's there. It's there somewhere. It appears somewhere, too. Yeah. Right. So and when you need it, he'll help you recall it. Right. Or he'll give me new things. Or he'll give you new things. Yeah. 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 But uh, I like that. And of course, we, we talked about search for them as you would for silver. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me if uh, you knew there were silver buried in your backyard, a big <laughs> cache of silver in your backyard. Would you go out there one day on the weekend with shovel, dig for an hour? Then give up? Nope. No. <laughs> no grass left until the five the summer. Right. No grass left. Right. You'd be you'd be digging a hole big enough to put in a new pool. <laughs> right. But you wouldn't be out there with just a shovel. I've I've well, dug a hole like that by hand before. So yeah. the old testament illustration, the guy went out, spent everything he had to get the field. To get the field. There was a yep. treasure there. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And then of course it says. Once you've done this, seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord and you will gain knowledge of God. So now the second question I have, and I've made some comments that may have already kind of tipped my hand on this, but how does this differ from how many Christians see God today? I seek God or seek God? Seek, seek. Seek the K. Yeah, with a K. How do how do many Christians go about looking for God? You go to church on church. Sunday. You go to church once a week. Once Not a week. Just on Sunday, because I mean, I'm sure there's some Adventists or the same. Well, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So they go to church once a week, usually. Maybe. Maybe, or you know, yeah, I would say Sabbath school and church. But honestly, I don't think very many of them come to Sabbath school. They just come for church. Mm -hmm. That's not just a problem with our church. That's no, a problem, problem with everywhere. Sunday churches, too. Yeah. And then, you know, they've got their daily dose, their weekly dose, and they're done. Mm -hmm. We used to have a lot of people come to Sabbath school. I know. Yep. It's the condition of the world. It is 
And for, for many people, uh, that was the time when they got most of their Bible study for the yes. week. Mm -hmm. They may spend a few minutes here or there. They may read through the lesson through the week, but they don't truly get that study time where they can get in there and, you know, converse with other people who have studied it, get different views, uh, and maybe get a clearer understanding of something that they didn't understand. Yeah. Um, that, to me, that's the best type of Sabbath schools. We can get an actual discussion going. Yeah. It is so hard to do that when there's just two or three people there. I oh, where I, I know can't. scripture the most yeah. was teaching Sabbath school. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The yeah. teacher, the, the teacher, teacher gets really. to gets to learn it really well. But uh, when there's only a couple of people there and you can't get them <laughs> talking, it's really kind of hard to have a good a good class. But all right, so that brings us to faith back number six. In order to grow, we need to actively pursue a closer relationship with God. This is not something that happens by accident. It's something we have to be purposeful about and actively pursue it. All right. Yeah, no, nobody is going to just fall into heaven. <laughs> not going to work that way. Right? Everyone who's there is there by choice. And by design, right? Matthew 5, 6 is our next text. We're tying, I believe, on this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. All right. And this is actually the key text for this week. Uh, I don't think I've been pointing out what the key texts were, but this, this is one for this week. And it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Now, when you're hunger, hungry and you're thirsty... What do you look for? Water. Water or food, right? You're actively seeking. I mean, you're you're on the hunt, right? You're on the brow, actively looking for. So if your hunger and thirst are for righteousness. And what is righteousness? Well, that'd be God. Right? God is righteousness. Yes. Right. So you're actually going to be looking for it, actually seeking, taking steps to find it and to grab a hold of it when you find it. And then it says. At the end, for they will be filled. Now, there's a promise there. Yeah, so you'll have just enough. Yeah. Fill. You're going to be full. Yeah. Right? Full. You're not going to be walking away with a little hunger pains. This is going to satisfy you. So faith fact number seven says a hunger and thirst for righteousness must precede the filling of God. See, I think some Christians, they get the idea that, you know, they're going to walk into church and God's going to run over there like a funnel and just sh pour it in. Sh right. You just yeah. take your head up and he's going to just pour it in and push you on out and get like an assembly line or just crank them out, fill them up, move them out. That's not how God operates. Right. It's not how he operates at all. He's he wants you to come to his table. I'm, right. And he'll serve you and he'll I'm fill you. But you you've got to come to him. I learned that as a child. I came to Christ because I found it difficult to obey mom and dad. So I came to Christ and because the promise was in Christ we could be righteous. Mm -hmm. we, could, we could be obedient. It didn't work that way. Oh. No? It didn't work that way. I learned much later that uh, He's in you, but you've got to be listening and you've got to be in the word and praying. It's got to be a lifestyle. It has to be a lifestyle. And, and again, it, it takes it takes time. All right. So let's move on to our next one. And Nicole, this is the longer one. So you got the long verse for today. It's long. You got the long one for today. Short one. For today. All right, 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21. It sounds long because it is long. <laughs> because we understand our fe fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us. You can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If, we see, if it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. 
Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are, yeah. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. But God made Christ to never sin, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Right. There's a lot in here. I've, I've actually underlined quite a few things that I want to talk about. I want to go back up towards the beginning where it talks about here. So you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry <laughs> rather than having a sincere heart. All right. Have you ever seen that? Yes. People are bragging about their ministry and all the ministry. Now, Ministry is a good thing. We're here for the purpose of ministry. Right. So since your heart is. No, we don't always know. We don't always know. But we know that again, if we're going to be bragging, we shouldn't. So I I, I don't want to say I cringe every time we we say good things. I think we need to praise the people who are doing the work. Uh because it's that is something that is received positively that can help re-energize them for more ministry. And when you only have a handful of people doing all the work, you want to keep them energized. <laughs> but we we don't want to get confused and equate busyness with righteousness. Right? They're, they're, they're not yeah. the same. Right. So, so it's great to be busy, but that can't be your focus. So there's an Old Testament example also. Uh, I forgot who it was, but he, something good happened, and he claimed the credit for doing it himself, and, and God struck him, struck him dead with worms. Oh, I forgot who that was, but there is one of the Old Testament kings. Yeah, the, also those Old Testament kings had issues. Yeah, they they had some issues. <clears throat> they did. He just. He took credit for what God had done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So I don't I don't want anyone to think that I'm saying that all these people who have spectacular ministries have insincere hearts, because that's not what I'm saying. We just want to make sure that uh, when we have ministry that is doing really well, we want to make sure that we don't forget why that ministry is there. Yes. Right. This is all about bringing people to Jesus. Right. So we, we can get all wrapped up in feeding the poor. Uh, they're feeding the hungry, even close to the poor and all that, but yet you never introduce anyone to Christ. Are you doing good? Yes. Are you accomplishing your mission? No, you're not, right? Because those people are still going to be hungry the next day, right? You're not doing anything to change their lives. You're just taking care of their physical need, which is important. That should be a starting point for more. That shouldn't be your end point. Right. So we don't want to get uh, all wrapped up in ministry just for the sake of ministry. Right. There's a purpose for that. All right. So that was the first thing I saw. Second thing, since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. Mm -hmm. Right. So if we believe that, then what, what happens to that old life? It should disappear. It should disappear, right? Your your new life should be very different from your old life, right? And then it gets down here, and I like this point. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view, right? We need to stop doing that, right? Stop judging. Stop judging, yep. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, and the, the world looks at Christ from a human point of view, Right? Uh, they like to say, oh, he was a good teacher. And I'm like, well, yeah. you don't really have that option. Christ took that option away from us. You can either believe what he said, that he is a son of God, 
or he was a raving lunatic, <laughs> right? And, and a blasphemer and deserved what he got. One or the other, there's no middle ground. Christ does not give you the option of taking the middle ground, right? How differently we know him now. Right? This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. So once you belong to Christ, you become a new person. Now, that initial change may be little. Some people, it's a huge change right mm -hmm. at the start. But in most cases, it's small changes that comes in increments. As you get to know him better, things change. But you are a new person from that very first day. You just haven't had a chance to build up the track record yet. Right. Um, I just lost my place. Oh, here we go. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Right. And all of this is a gift from God. So it's not anything you did. It's all something that he did. And then skip down a little further. It says, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Remember, why, why did Christ come? Show who God really was. He showed who God really was. And in the very next sentence, it says, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now, if you are a disciple of Christ, right, his mission becomes your mission. So if he had a mission of reconciliation, that means we have a mission of reconciliation. Right. And he gave us, it goes down a little further, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. Now, what does an ambassador do? One who speaks for someone else. Speaks for someone else, right? Right. They're on, usually they are on foreign soil. Right. So think about that. If we're ambassadors, this is earth is foreign soil to us, right? This is not our home. We don't belong here. And we're here to speak for Christ, not for ourselves. So we are to represent Christ. Now, so that means sure, our behavior should be different. Would you want to send an ambassador for to a foreign country who acted like uh, just the average person off the street? No. Probably not. You want to send someone who is going to represent the best, the best that you have to offer. Right. So we're Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. Right. He could he could accomplish this anyway. Right. And, you know, in Jesus time, it, when they asked him to have the people stop uh, praising him, he says, if, if the people stop, the rocks would cry out. God could do that. He could have the trees and the rocks. Of course, it would freak a lot of people out, <laughs> but he could have them do that. But he prefers to do it through us. So we sport we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. All right. So this. Sounds like now this has moved beyond uh, something that he has given to a select few. Right? This seems to be something that is everybody has a role in. Yeah. Right. So now when we reread this, the, the question I ask, so as we are transformed, how does it affect our behavior? We should be more loving and kind. Or loving no. and kind. Hmm. Between others before ourselves. Okay. Others before ourselves. Okay. Would it be safe to say that as we are transformed, our our behavior should more closely reflect Christ's behavior? Yeah. I'm sorry. Absolutely. All right. So faith fact number eight. Our outward behavior becomes more like God as Christ continues the inward transformation of the heart. I think it's important for people to understand that it develops over time. Because you get some people get frustrated, especially the new Christians, right? They they may come with a lot of bad habits and they want them all gone like that. And it usually doesn't work that way. Right. God may he start little a little bit of it, because if you did it all at once, you might go through, it could be a shock to your system. Uh, people could have withdrawals. You know, we don't know. Of course, God can cure all that. But mm -hmm. but usually he works in increments because he doesn't want to overwhelm people. I think if uh, most people, if they're really hooked on a lot of different things that are bad for them, uh, a lot of lifestyles and, and God would just say, well, you got to give all that up at once. Uh, mentally or psychologically, it might be too much. Mm -hmm. And they would just turn away. Mm -hmm. So God doesn't normally work that way, right? It's a, 
a step-by-step -step incremental process. All right, we're almost done. We are to the last verse I have for tonight, Psalms 27, 4. And I believe, we're back to Carmen. Mm -hmm. Carmen, you get to finish this off. <laughs> Psalms 27, 4. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditation, meditating in his temple. All right. That's interesting. If you think of what, what uh, David was writing when he wrote this, right? He want, the thing he seeks the most is to live in the house of the Lord. So what is it he's truly desiring there? Is it the house? No, it's the presence. It's the presence of the Lord, right? It says delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple, right? He wants to be where God is, right? right? He wants to know him in an intimate manner that was impossible for him to do uh, on this life. Now, we know that David had a lot of issues, but we also know that David had that special relationship mm -hmm. with God. Mm -hmm. He messed up plenty, which was because he was human. And every now and then, uh, I guess, as a king, got to his head and he would do stupid things. Um, that's why I say power corrupts. Even the good people, power corrupts. But he would repent, always repented, always came back, always was sorrowful, pleaded with the Lord, and the Lord forgave him over and over and over again. I love David's example because it shows me two things. One, I don't think I could ever do anything as spectacularly bad as what he did, at least not on that scale. But yet uh, God forgave him, so I know God can forgive me. Yeah. I don't want to say that David was a horrible person, but he was in a position to where his mess-ups <laughs> had huge results. I'm not in that kind of position. My mess ups are not going to have that kind of that kind of result. But um, that doesn't mean my mess ups are not as bad. Right. But if God can forgive him, though, I know he can forgive me. But uh, the faith fact we want to get to here is God desires us to know him intimately. Right. The relationship David's talking about here is not one where he just visits him once a week or maybe for a few minutes in the morning, right? He's talking about here of living in his presence, right? This goes way beyond just a mere knowledge about him. And which is something else I wanted to bring up. Is it enough to just know about God? No. 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 Devil knows a lot about God. Yeah, there's... Doesn't do him any good. <laughs> no good whatsoever. And Satan knows the Bible inside and out. So it's not just knowing the Bible either. Right, you have to have that relationship. That's why I think when we go back to that very first verse that we read, right, it says the way to eternal life is to know the only true God, Jesus Christ, and know them on an intimate level. So this is talking about a deep relationship, not just a surface relationship. There's going to be a lot of people at the end of time who think that they know God. Right, because they've got that surface relationship, so they think God is. Yeah, yeah, and no, yeah. they don't know God. Right, they don't. They're going to be doing things in His name, which He's not going to agree. And Jesus even said, you know, they're going to be doing miracles in His name and all that. But He's going to say, I don't know you, uh, and He's going to cast them aside because they didn't develop that relationship. All right, so we don't have any more text to read. We do have a few minutes, so there are a few questions at the end of the chapter I'd like to discuss. We don't always get to these. Some of them we've talked about. <laughs> yeah, some it does. So let's. So well, this should be a quick hit then, right? So what does it take to know God? To true, truly know God. Spend time with Him. Spend time with Him. Okay. Mostly wanting to know Him. Wanting to know Him. Listen. Seeking him, listening to him. So it's uh, two-way communication, mm -hmm. right? You, you don't get to know somebody by just sitting there and talking to them. And just talking. You, know, you have to listen. They have to have a chance to talk back. Right? And then you have to actually listen to what they say. Right? And you have to spend time with them. Right? You have to seek uh, to know them. So when you seek to know somebody, 
then you're looking for, you know, what do you like? Right. What are the things that make you happy? Would it be weird if you uh, were friends with someone for 10 years and you didn't know what they liked? You know, what do you do for fun? You know, never ask. Right. So it means you probably never had fun with them yeah. <laughs> after 10 years. Not much of a friend. Right. That's the kind of thing you say, oh, God, what, are the... <laughs> what do they want now? <laughs> That's an acquaintance. That's not a friend. All right. So what are some characteristics of a transformed mind? When we talked about the transformed mind. It helps you remember the text where it says having the mind of Christ. Yeah, it's like, well, you have time, you were saying loving, kind. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, it's like you're thinking of other people in ways that you can help them. You're not, you're not selfish because you think about it. Satan is selfish. Yes. It's all me, 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 me. Jesus is all, what do you need? What can I do to help? What kind of help do I, can I give you? And to me, that's, the transform mind when you start thinking like Jesus does instead of always going me 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 me. When am I going to get out of this? It's more of a what? Okay, what can I do to help you? How can I use this to help somebody else or to help do God's will? Okay. God, how can I do? How can you use me to further your will along? Okay, so I'm getting one characteristic of a transform mind is change in focus. It, instead yeah. of being focused inwardly on yourself it's focused outwardly on others all right so i like that are there any other characteristics the transform mind is one that can understand what it doesn't see mm -hmm. so if you say if fair to say that the transform mind is maybe more receptive to uh to God's will yeah. and the different ways he communicates yeah. that to you. Right. So uh, when you say, you know, you hear people say all the time, God, give me a sign and God's throwing signs left and right, but they don't understand. Yeah. Right? They don't see. It's like the joke about the guy on his roof after the flood. Yeah. yeah. God says, I sent uh, two rowboats and a helicopter. What more do you want? Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just cutting that one short. Uh, and sometimes in our earthly understanding, we don't see the things that are right in front of us. God's, I mean, he's, throwing all kinds of stuff out there to get our attention. And we're just not catching it. just not seeing it. But the transform mind, you start to see those things all around is God communicates in many, many different ways. Right. So the transform mind is more receptive. Um, the transform mind is always seeking to know more. Mm -hmm. Right. So, which is interesting. So it's, it doesn't sound like it's a transformation that ever ends. You're constantly being transformed, right? Uh, the other questions on here, how would you interpret hunger and thirst found in Matthew 5, 6? I think we talked about that one pretty well already. Um, why does knowing God consist of more than merely knowing facts about him? I think we we answered that one pretty well as well. Yeah. Knowing God is a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. It's a relationship, right? Yeah. Right. Can you have a relationship with your spouse? Well, you know, you know the birthday, social security number, <laughs> Ring size, you know all that stuff, but but that's it. It's not gonna not gonna do you any good. Um, all right, that's just all surface stuff. And God wants that deep relationship with us. All right. And then, of course, uh, the final question they have here: the experience at this point in the spiritual journey is it your desire to intimately know God? And obviously, if you're wanting to continue as a disciple of Christ. And that would be something that you would want to do because obviously Jesus had a very intimate relationship with the father. And if we want to be his disciples, we should want that same relationship with Jesus that he had with his father, which would also lead us to have that same relationship with the father. So we should be seeking uh, to get to know God intimately, which means we're going to be doing all those things we talk. About. And keep in mind you're going to get frustrated. Uh, people are going to watch this. You're going to get frustrated when things don't seem to be happening fast enough. But at the same time, if you keep your eyes open, you're going to have gems start popping out at you. You're going to start noticing things that you, I've said this before, I can read a text I read a hundred times and all of a sudden something new pops out. 
that I, a guy maybe just never made the connection before, especially if I'm looking at the whole passage. And, and um, I forget what the text is. I preached like three or four different sermons on one text because it, it, every every time I looked at it, something new popped up. I said, oh, I got to do this. And I go back and revise and preach something else. Um, and they're all different. But it was it's that kind of thing that will start to happen. And you'll get to know God better. You'll start to be more aware of his leading and you'll see more things being fulfilled. You'll be more satisfied in your relationship with God. And then maybe your church life won't seem quite so, uh, I don't want to say empty. Um, yeah, a lot of people just don't feel like there's, it seems kind of maybe pointless or um, fruitless. Fruitless, that's the word I'm looking for, not pointless, fruitless. Yeah. Because uh, we know we talk about the fruits of the Spirit. And I'm talking about the gifts of the Spirit, but the fruits. So mm -hmm. the fruits, when the Spirit is in you, you start having that loving character comes out. You start living that kind of life. And it shows. And you have people say, why am I not showing these fruits yet? Like, maybe you haven't been transformed yet. Mm -hmm. You're holding something back. But not that I want to judge, because I'm not judging anyone on earthly standards. Mm -hmm. And it's like I say, some people get there faster than others. But I hope you all enjoyed that study. We are finishing early. I'm not going to drag this out just to fill the hour. <laughs> uh, next week, we'll be talking about the gospel of grace. Uh, and for those of you watching, the lesson after the gospel of grace is the kingdom of God in heaven. That will actually, I will be covering that one in my sermon next Sabbath. So... We're going to have two part next week. If you want on Friday night, one on Saturday, Saturday morning, they'll both be recorded. I will post uh, that one here, but it's, it'll be the whole service because I can't just post just the sermon. So just bear in mind when that gets dropped in uh, for the people who watch online, it's going to be a whole service, not just the study. So just bear with it. I'm sure you'll enjoy the songs and things at the beginning. And then you'll get to me and hopefully you'll you'll hold on to that. <laughs> All right. Any thoughts before we close with prayer? No. Let's bow our heads. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this study tonight. We thank you uh, for the reassurance that if we seek you, we will find you. We thank you for the knowledge that you have given us already. Uh and the fact that you seek us and desire us to seek you back. Lord, we ask that you will help us to develop that personal relationship with you, that your those fruits of the Spirit may be revealed in our lives. Lord, we thank you for answering this prayer. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.